Hi, Mick McQuaid here to talk to you about R Markdown and three concepts that go along with R Markdown. I had previously recorded a video showing uh, the creation of Homework 1 as an R Markdown document, but I didn't really explain R Markdown. I didn't really talk through what R Markdown is, why you might want to use it, where it comes from. So that's what I that's the purpose of this uh, short video or actually long video sorry um, is to, to explain a little bit about that so there are three concepts that I want to talk about literate programming which involves bundling code and uh, an explanation of code for readability purposes reproducible research which involves bundling of code and uh, explanation for reproducibility purposes and uh, markup language which can be bundled with with code and then I want to talk a little bit about R Markdown itself so uh, let me start with um, uh, let me start at the beginning with literate programming so Donald Knuth wrote an article in uh, 1983 called literate programming um, here's an extract from the article and in this article he promoted the idea let me just uh, read the the text here let us change our traditional attitude to the construction of programs instead of imagining that our main task is to instruct a computer what to do let us concentrate rather on explaining to human beings what we want a computer to do so that's the core idea of, of literate programming and in order to implement literate programming Knuth developed a system which he called web Remember, this is 1983, so he couldn't foresee that web was not the optimal name for uh, a system. Um, so he created this system called web, and the system consisted of a couple of programs, weave and tangle. So all of these five items in the uh, sort of ovals are files and the arrows refer to programs or processes that act on those files so there there could actually be an additional one here that would say text editor pointing to web so this is the web file and the web file is a bundle of code and explanation of the of that code and it's written in a sort of storytelling format so the idea is that the story is the first and most important thing and the weave program sends the story part of the program to um, a tech file so you can write a, a tech document and it can be processed by the tech processor and create a device independent file that can be viewed by a human alternatively you can separately send using the tangle program the computer program part of this the source code to a pascal file this is a pascal source code file that can be sent to a pascal compiler and get object code out so the process involves two branches and two things that could be acted upon by a person two files that could be acted upon by a person but here are generated automatically from this file and therein lies a problem which is that a lot of people don't like to do documentation uh, or explanation so they don't like creating this file they like to go straight to the source code that's what people are familiar with is writing source code um, some people are familiar with writing documents but writing both of them together in one file that has a special syntax can be a little bit difficult and um, another problem is the particular target for this one is Pascal, um, which waned in popularity. And so Knuth came up with another uh, system called C-Web that you, I should say Knuth and Levy, came up with a system called C-Web that used C instead of Pascal that was a little bit more popular. Later on, it says here, this is actually an error on Wikipedia's part, 
later on they amended this for C++ and Java and they wrote a book uh, about the C-Web system. So that solved one of the problems with, um, with uh, Web. Uh, Norman Ramsey wrote a system called NoWeb that, that to some extent solved another problem, which is a lot of people didn't like to write in tech. Um, there's a macro package called LaTeX that runs on top of tech that is much more popular. So Ramsey's system used LaTeX instead, and Ramsey's system allowed you to use a lot of different programming languages. So I've used CWeb and NoWeb both, and the main problem that I've encountered is not so much um, the lack of popularity of them as the fact that people just don't want to do documentation. People want to just work on the code and let the documentation come later or not at all in, in many cases, unfortunately. So that's, um, that's a problem. And of course, everybody has to, to know the same uh, language all the collaborators have to be able to work in the same language, so that's that's a bit of a problem too. Yet, literate programming has become somewhat popular in some areas. In academia, it's certainly popular. In cryptography, it's popular. In uh, data science, it's popular. And in particular, in data science, uh, Jupyter Notebook is a, a version of literate programming that's popular. And R Markdown, which here, Wikipedia, and this is just a mistake, Wikipedia calls it R Notebooks. What they mean here is R Markdown. Um, so these are, are two popular methods in, in, uh, in data science for doing literate programming. So again, the concept of literate programming bundles code and explanation of code together in one file uh, with the emphasis on the storytelling. Okay, now the second concept is reproducible research, and I found a good definition from Coursera just by Googling reproducible research. I like this definition. It is the idea that data analyses and more generally scientific claims are published with their data and software code so that others may verify the findings and build upon them. So here we have bundling of code and explanation for reproducibility purposes. And this came from the reproducibility crisis or the replication crisis, uh, which is a crisis in science, or it's been identified as a crisis in science. For example, in uh, Nature, uh, I think this was a poll was in, in uh, the popular science journal Nature or Science, one, of, one or the other. Uh, 1,500 scientists reported that 70% of them had failed to reproduce at least one other science scientists experiment and 50% had failed to reproduce one of their own experiments. So there are many um, uh, reasons for this. One which is not that common is falsifying studies, um, but there are many other uh, reasons for uh, failing to be able to reproduce. Uh, let me give you an example from our homework. So our homework, homework one, involves the college data set. So that data set has 777 rows, each row representing a college. Suppose that while you were doing that homework, I got another row and contributed that to you. So I now have, have given you 778 colleges, 778 examples of statistics about colleges. There certainly are plenty more than 778 colleges available to get statistics about. And so some of your results are about 777, and some are about 778. Um, that's potentially uh, a problem. One that there, there is potentially a discrepancy there. And one thing that people do that I find really pitiful is uh, non-reproducible research, using non-reproducible research tools like SPSS and Microsoft Word. And what they do is run an analysis in SPSS and then cut and paste the results into uh, Microsoft Word. And um, they have to, if the data changes, they have to remember to go back and, and rerun the analysis and cut and do the correct cutting and pasting. Now, if on the other hand, you use reproducible research tools like R and R Markdown, you can do the following. So let's use that example of getting the additional uh, row of data. So in the text of the report, <coughs> you can include 
R code. So let's say I write a sentence saying uh, this report concerns 777 colleges. So instead of writing the number 777, I can instead write backtick the letter R and then a space and then n row, that's n r o w, begin paren, college, n paren, backtick, um, and then the rest of my rest of my text. And that section, that that section that's delimited by backticks and the letter r, will resolve the value of the function n row college. And the value of that function at the beginning, uh, when you first render the document, is 777. But when you render the document for the last time, because we've added this additional row, it's 778. So the document keeps pace with changes in the data and changes in uh, outcomes from the data. So we can we can seamlessly put together the um, the data, the code and the explanation. And that's what reproducible research is about. Okay, the third concept I want to talk about is uh, markup language. And to talk about mark, there are loads and loads of markup languages, but to talk about markup languages, the easiest thing to do is to talk about HTML. That's the most common, um, the most basic uh, markup language that pretty much everybody knows. If you don't know it, you're in trouble. Um, and here's an example. Here's the Hello World example done in HTML. And HTML was intended to be a much simpler markup language than the languages that preceded it. It has a much smaller vocabulary of tags and uh, attributes of those tags. And uh, it was intended for the general population to be able to write in. But you can see from this example that it's still a little bit complicated. There's still a lot of tags. To write hello world, I had to write all these, these, uh, these tags. Now HTML is very forgiving. I could have just written hello world, and I believe that uh, uh, most HTML parsers will render hello world, but it's not correct. This is the correct. Um, it should be enclosed in HTML and in HTML tags. It should be, in, there should be a head and there should be a body. So I can get along without these things, and, and this is an opening of a paragraph and the closing of a paragraph. I can get along without these because HTML parsers are forgiving, but let's distinguish between the HTML language, the markup language, and the converters or parsers or renderers that let us see the HTML rendered. You have to be aware that there are these two things going on. So HTML is, as I say, the, the basic markup language. It's widely used, for example, by bloggers. So here's a, a prominent blogger, John Gruber, writes the blog Daring Fireball, writes a lot of interesting blog posts, vast number of blog posts. And John Gruber got tired of having to write HTML for all these blog posts. So he has uh, titles, for example, for his blog posts. So he's presumably writing uh, angle bracket H1, end angle bracket, Yankees clinch 27th straight, blah, 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 angle bracket, slash H1, end angle bracket. And that, that's tedious. You know, there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of stuff to be writing. So uh, back in 2004, Gruber invented a markup language called Markdown to be a simpler form of HTML that would cover the base, some of the base cases that he used HTML for. So for example, we can, we can more simply, oh, I think there's actually a, uh, an example here somewhere. Uh, yeah, you can view the markdown source for the article text on this page here. So here is markdown uh, text. You can do a first level heading by uh, putting a row of dashes underneath it. The other thing you can do, which has become more popular, is to put a hash symbol in front of it for H1, two hash symbols for H2, and so on. And you can use, um, they're, they're actually, this is kind of old-fashioned now, 
this is from 2004. I'm, let me go back to, to this because I don't want to get too involved in, in uh, um, Gruber's version of Markdown. Uh, that was the first version of Markdown. It, it is this uh, language or syntax, and it is a software tool, but there are many software tools now. This was the first one, uh, but there are many uh, Markdown converters that convert Markdown into uh, HTML. And here's Gruber's syntax. There, are, It doesn't cover all the cases of um, that you might want to cover in creating an HTML document, but it covers the base cases. It, it covers most of what you write. And then uh, a nice thing about Markdown converters, about pretty much all Markdown converters, is that they will pass through any HTML that you write. So anything that wasn't covered by a Markdown construct, you can just write the HTML in. Um, there, are, As I say, Gruber's version was the first version. There are many other Markdown converters. Let me mention the two most popular ones, which are GitHub Markdown and Pandoc. So with GitHub Markdown, I want to mention uh, one thing that there's a good example of in the, in the uh, GitHub Markdown cheat sheet, and that is syntax highlighting. So one of the things that I can write in a Markdown document is a code chunk. And if I write a code chunk, uh, I can, and I enclose the code chunk in backticks, I can do something special, which is I can say what language the code chunk is in. I can write the language after the first row of backticks, and then uh, it will render uh, in syntax highlighting that's appropriate for that language. So here we see some JavaScript rendered in an appropriate style for, for JavaScript. Here we see some Python rendered in an appropriate style for Python. Here we see one that didn't have a language mentioned, so it's perfectly legal to uh, insert rows of backticks without mentioning a specific language. This particular case uh, it appears the language is HTML, but there's no syntax highlighting here. Syntax highlighting is just a, uh, an extra. Okay, the other, so this is uh, GitHub Markdown is the uh, markdown for readme files on GitHub repositories. And GitHub has a converter, has a markdown converter that converts this, and there, there's plenty of uh, explanation here. It's a fairly simple syntax like the original one. It's got a little bit more uh, material than, than uh, Gruber's original markdown syntax, but not too much. The other popular one is Pandoc. Pandoc is much more elaborate than Gruber's original version, and Pandoc is the version that I use. So I use it for the syllabus for this class. I use it for, in fact, all my syllabuses or syllabi and all my homework specifications, all my lecture notes, any pretty much anything that, that goes to PDF output is starts life as a markdown document in my uh, work and is converted by Pandoc. And Pandoc converts markdown into HTML, LaTeX, and yuck, other formats that we may not appreciate as much. And ultimately is used to create uh, PDFs. And as I say, it has a lot of um, extra features beyond what the original Markdown specification had. And with all those extra features, uh, it's easy to do articles or papers or reports that are elaborate. And so uh, when we speak of uh, literate programming or reproducible research and bundling code, with explanations for readability in the case of literate programming or reproducibility in the case of reproducible research, that uh, is satisfied best by uh, an elaborate, um, a, a more elaborate uh, version of Markdown that lets us use a very easy syntax for most of what we're doing, but lets us do some more complicated stuff as well. And so consequently, uh, Pandoc is used for R Markdown, so, so, so that's the main reason that I'm mentioning Pandoc is not so much because I use it, but because it's the Markdown flavor that's used by R Markdown. Okay, and then the final markup language that's used by R Markdown is YAML, and YAML's current title is 
uh, YAML ain't markup language, so it's a recursive title. Um, and it started life. It, it, originally, YAML was written in 2001, and it was called Yet Another Markup Language. And after a while, uh, the author thought it would be more clever to call it um, YAML ain't markup language uh, and join the family of recursive acronyms and be more specific because it's it's really a, a data serialization language. Um, and it's a data serialization language that can be used within other languages. And this is YAML's web page, believe it or not. And YAML's web page is written as a YAML document. And YAML documents are mostly key value pairs. So here we have a key. And what makes it a key value pair is a colon followed by a space and then the value. And YAML can accept uh, spaces in the values. It can't accept spaces. Well, I shouldn't say that. It, I guess it can accept spaces in the keys. Um, but the the uh, the uh, key must be followed by a colon and a space. And uh, the keys can be elaborate. By by the way, YAML is a superset of JSON, so you can actually use JSON. Uh, wherever you use YAML, um, and it accepts elaborate uh, values. So here's a key, and the value of that key is itself a list of key value pairs. Okay, so it's, it's a fairly elaborate configuration language, and it's used in R Markdown. So now let's talk a little bit about R Markdown. So as I say, R Markdown is an example of literate programming. So it is bundling code and um, explanation together for readability purposes. And it's also a bundling, it's also an example of reproducible research because it's an example of bundling code and explanation for reproducibility purposes. And it was invented in 2012 by this person, Yi Li Xie. I might be butchering his name. I've actually seen him speak and, and uh, seen him introduce himself, but I, I still am not sure of pronouncing his name. Um, so he wrote this as a uh, package, in, originally wrote this as a package in R, so it works a little bit more simply than a lot of reproducible research and a lot of, of um, literate programming packages. Um, you basically, you, you create a document in R Markdown and then you, um, well, let me show you. Uh, here's the R Markdown cheat sheet, and it shows uh, the, R, the R Studio IDE in this rectangle here. Um, this is the R Studio IDE. That's one way to create an R Markdown document. And it has a knit button, and that button creates the output. Uh, you can also create output in R. By, so you don't have to use R Studio. This is a plain text document. The only reason that it's highlighted is syntax highlighting. Um, you don't write in that highlighting. You just type in plain text, and it highlights it according to the syntax. So I usually use a, uh, a text editor, Vim, to create R Markdown documents. It's, it's absolutely fine to use any text editor to create R Markdown documents. It's just very convenient to do it in, in R Studio, and if you do it in a plain text editor, you would, in then in R, you would write library R Markdown render report dot rmd or whatever the name of the file is, in order to um, accomplish the same goal that you would accomplish by pressing the knit button, <coughs> and the output of that is an HTML uh, document or a PDF. Uh, or uh, it can be one of these other yucky formats. So um, the process shown here, so this is the workflow. This um, large rectangle here shows the workflow. And the, the workflow is actually pretty simple. It's write document and knit. So parts two and, and three here are, are, the, uh, are the main workflow here. So you write a document in plain text and you knit or render the, the document um, to an output format, to a report format. And so you have two artifacts. You have the uh, RMD file, this plain text file, 
and then you have the um, the report, uh, a PDF file. In the case of our class, I insist that you uh, render to PDF, uh, but you can also render to HTML, but not in our class. You have to do PDF in our class, which may not be a great idea. Um, I often get pushback from students about that, and um, I'll, I'll go into more details about that at another time. Okay, so this cheat sheet is useful, although it's it certainly is a uh, a packed uh, amount of information. Um, it mentions to us, for example, the structure of the RMD file, which consists of a YAML header, text, and this text isn't just text. I wish actually they would mention that you can put math and images and other stuff in the text and code chunks. So those three things. The YAML header is enclosed in three dashes, so a row of three dashes or hyphens, and so it's preceded by a row of three hyphens and followed by a row of three hyphens, and it is a set of key value pairs in the YAML style. So there's a, a key followed by a uh, colon and a space followed by the value, and the quotation marks here are optional. And then we have um, another a uh, key, a colon and a space, and another value. Then we have a key and a colon and a space, and then a list which is indented in Python style. Python recommends four spaces. It can't be tabs in YAML, by the way. It has to be spaces. Um, but they've done two spaces here, and then that's another key, and then the, the value for that is indented is indented further uh, and that is another key and value and you can see that in addition to strings the value can be a boolean so in this case the value is the boolean value true and it is simply true saying that a table of contents will be generated and here's the table of contents there's only one section this is a rather short uh, file it only has one section that section is denoted by these two hash marks which make an H2 heading and um, this is that H2 heading here so that's the only item in the table of contents this is dynamic so if I click on this in the HTML or PDF document it will go to this uh, heading and so you can imagine that we could put a lot of headings in here and go to the relevant uh, sections immediately then there's some text here, and as I mentioned, this text can include mathematical expressions written in LaTeX. It can include images. The images can be included. There's a simple syntax for including external images, or gener you can do generated images also within the, the document. And then uh, there are code chunks, and these code chunks are slightly different from other forms of uh, of Markdown, <coughs> in that the code chunks can have a label. And if they have a label, that label has to be unique. So this is a problem that students have. Um, they copy the code chunks and they forget to write in a new label. So they copy the code chunks and in order to just copy the back ticks and the uh, curly brace followed by the R. And they leave the same code chunk name and it doesn't render properly. In addition to a label, you can have a comma delimited list of options, and I think those options are given um, somewhere else in this cheat sheet. Um, where are the options? I don't see them right offhand. But anyway, one of the options is include. Include equals false is not the default. The default is include equals true. This include equals false means that this code chunk won't be displayed in the output. So you can see that there's nowhere in the output that you see nit r ops chunk set echo equals true. This is an option, um, this is a function that just makes the rest of the code chunks by default appear. And th so you can see that this particular code chunk appears here. But the default behavior is for the code chunk to be evaluated. So cars is a built-in data set in R. So summary cars 
just gives us this summary here of cars. And by default, it, it does it with um, two um, hash marks in front of it in the rendered output. You can ch actually change that in this. You can, there's, you can set another option here to change what the character is here. There are a lot, all kinds of options that you can set. Um, and of course, we can include uh, HTML here. Um, let's look at what we can include in an R Markdown document. So we can, we can use Pandoc flavored Markdown in the document. So plain text, so this column here is what we would type in, and this column here is what we would see as output. So we can type in plain text and we get plain text. We can end a line with two spaces. We get a new paragraph. We can put asterisks around a uh, word and get italics. We can put two asterisks around a word and get bold. Uh, we can put backticks around words and get verbatim code. So that's um, like a programming listing. If we also put the language in here, so if I put a letter R, followed by a space between the backtick and the letter V here, then this would actually be run as R code and it would be replaced in the text. It wouldn't be displayed. It would be, it would be um, replaced in the text by the result of the R code. And so there are a whole bunch of other things here. We can do headers with hash marks, which you saw in the example here. Um, and there are here are the options that we can set in the YAML header. Uh, there are actually more options than these, so th this is this is actually a subset of uh, options. And it says here options not listed, but there are actually even more than the options that aren't listed. This is a potentially really complicated, but you don't really need to use most of this complicated stuff. Um, there are different ways to include tables. I showed in homework one. I think I showed this way cable, uh, but you can also use X table or stargazer, and there are others besides these. So this is just a, uh, a fairly simple uh, example, and your homework assignments for the most part are fairly simple examples. Um, your project, on the other hand, the project for this class could get more elaborate. Okay, so that's pretty much all that I want to say about our markdown for now. Um, the biggest problem that people have with R Markdown usually is installing it. Um, the fact that I require the use of PDF creates a problem because in order for, for you to generate PDF, you have to have uh, tech on your computer. So you have to either have tech live or um, tiny tech. Um, the person who wrote R Markdown also wrote a version of tech called tiny tech that you can install. And in my homework specifications, I explain how to do that. It's also explained in the definitive guide. There's a, um, an installation section. The definitive guide is available free online. And uh, it explains how to install uh, R Markdown and how to install uh, Tiny Tech. You have to do these two things. And then Tiny Tech works in the background. You don't include it in your document. Uh, it just works in the background. You just do this once and then it's installed. And if you install both Tech Live, which is what I do, and Tiny Tech, uh, it gets confused uh, as to which you want to use. So you, you really want to only do one. For my class, you generally want to do this unless you're using Tech for other purposes, uh, as I do. That's why I install all of Tech Live. So you generally want to just do this. and. It's very easy to uninstall it. I think it says how to uninstall it. Um, huh, it doesn't say how to uninstall it here. Uh, if you Google uninstall Tiny Tech, it will lead you to how to uninstall it. And um, Sometimes you have to uninstall it and reinstall it, if you, um, particularly if you have um, Tech Live installed, it will cr create a pro create an issue. Um, 
but I don't really want to say much more about that. Uh, oh, I, one thing I do want to specify is that if you're using a Mac, I've discovered a problem that my Tech Live installation is not um, noticed by R. And so even though I have Tech Live installed, R claims that it's not installed. And I've discovered a solution to that. So let me. Um, Let me show you the solution to that. Oh, what is my password? I wasn't planning to do this. So I discovered that the solution to that was to place the path in this file. So here's the path to my Tech Live installation. Um, you only need to know this if you are doing Tech Live on a Mac, um, which I imagine is a subset of you. Okay, so that's pretty much it for um, for our markdown. Um, other than installation, I don't think it's very hard to use. And so um, um, I'm happy to answer questions about it. I'm very enthusiastic about it, so I want you to have a good experience with it. So I want you to, uh, to ask me questions about it rather than waste a lot of time trying to uh, puzzle through it. For um, questions about R, I often want you to puzzle through things. For questions about, how, you know, what you should do in the homework, I often want you to puzzle through um, and s figure out um, the, the problem-solving process works best with practice. But when it comes to this infrastructure, uh, our markdown, uh, I don't want you to have to puzzle through that. I want you to just ask me straight away if you're having problems with it. So I look forward to uh, speaking to you again soon. And thank you very much for your attention.